Hi, this is Tony from Remote AF. Uh, welcome to another series of our All the Remote Things. And today we've got a really special guest all the way from the UK. In fact, in his bedroom or somebody's bedroom in the UK is Christopher Bramley, one of our uh, guides. And we'll be interviewing him today around what it's like to be a RAF guide and, and the uses of the, the, the RAF material. Welcome, Christopher. Thanks, Tony. Good to finally catch up with you again. Been a little while. It has, it has. And you'll notice I called him Chris. I was being very, I was being very sincere, but normally we just call him Chris, right? <laughs> Excellent. All right, look, we, we've got a couple of questions for you, as I, as I said. And, and I think the first one that, you know, people really ask us a lot and, and really want to hear about is, you know, why are you choosing to use the, the remote agility framework over the other frameworks and patterns that are out there? So it'd be interesting to hear your take on it. I think that there are a number of layers to this. Um, I first heard about your work through uh, Ian Phillips, actually, um, who I speak to on a fairly semi-regular basis. Um, and we, we have lots of discussions about bits and pieces. And, you know, I'm, I'm not somebody who's just interested in agile, especially with a lot of the cultism and the um, you know, jumping on the bandwagonism that has happened. I mean, it happens in, in in a lot of these kind of industries. It's happened to Agile a little bit as well. And I think that you you start getting a lot of religious wars with purists and stuff. And I've always been interested in a much more agnostic approach. So, you know, it, it, speaking to me before, I've I've mentioned to you probably many many times how being holistic or having an ability to look at things holistically and be able to change the granularity of what you're doing in terms of resolution is critical to this because context changes at different strata at, at different cadences, right? So it's not just about an overall context. So you've got to be able to see big picture and see detail at the same time. Yeah. So with that in mind, I, I was talking to Ian a little, well, many, 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 many months ago now um, about developing what, what I'd started calling like a remote I, one of I think one of my contacts, one of my friends was calling it a remote uh, manifesto or something. And I was kind of exploring this. And he said, well, actually, these chaps in Australia have done uh, a lot of this. And I was like, oh, and simultaneously, like, ah, someone's already done it. And oh, thank God, someone's already done it. So <laughs> I that's when I kind of got in touch with you and started looking into it. And I was really impressed by what I saw in terms of the accumulation of agnostic methodologies that can be used contextually and that's a really important part for me so i started looking into it further now i've looked at a lot of different methodologies and i, I specifically term the methodologies of frameworks um, because i think that's a very overused term in a lot of instances but i've looked at a lot of methodologies and i've looked at the way that they it, it's very easy to buy into these especially with certification structures and everything else and what I, what really appealed to me about the RAF stuff um, was, excuse me for the uh, the shortening of it there, um, was the, the, the fact that it, it combined a lot of different areas, but without truncating them. And, you know, I think that that's something like um, a, a, a framework such as SAFE, for example, takes elements of Scrum and it takes elements of, of whatever, but they, they can be quite truncated. They're not quite the same necessarily as using the full methodology or, or set of methodologies. So. RAF uses the appropriate pieces, as far as I'm concerned, in the appropriate place. And that really appealed to me. And then I started looking at the canvases and I thought, wow, this really works because looking at stuff visually, but more importantly, and, and you know what I'm like about collaboration. I've done a number of talks on collaboration. Collaboration requires the investment of everyone involved in that particular ecosystem to achieve a goal. It is not the same as alignment, which is a very different thing. And the canvases encourage almost this kind of automatic investment, involvement of people, whatever kind of level they're at. And that really appealed to me. So overall, I found it very appealing and I've started using it. And in the real world, the response I get to using a, a remote AF canvas over, you know, just pulling down another picture of Scrum or something, it, it's very interesting, it's, it's quite telling. And, and I use um, remote AF just as a kind of segue in as a positioning tool to discover what then the appropriate methodologies, if indeed there are any set ones, I should be using. So I, I know we talk about remote AF as a framework, 
um, I actually view it more of a lens, not quite the same as something like Kinevin, but I use it as a positioning lens for orientation to then make the appropriate decisions. So there we go. There's a Chris answer for you. Oh, thank you, Chris. Yeah, that was brilliant. That's brilliant. Let me pick you up a little, a little bit further on that because you know you're talking about how you use it. So I guess, uh, and I know that you use it within organisations. So I guess you know it'd be good for the audience to hear what, what, what's it like and what's your experience of using RAF and, and those canvases that you were talking about with the, the differing organisations that you're working with. So this is a, this is a. a a lot of depth um, lurks in the answer, and I'm, I'm aware that you know we could talk about this for a long time. But just to give a few examples, um, I have proposed it, run it, and kind of um, discussed it with a number of organisations ranging from global enterprise down to kind of more local, down to even small. Um, the small companies seem to be very interested in what it can offer down the line, but it's quite hard to buy into something when you're at that entrepreneurial stage where there's a lot of chaos and you know you, you aren't actually looking for structure, you're looking for direction. Um, so that that's more important. So I think some of the principles underlying remote AF are more important there, where you talk about, look, keep these in mind for later, because if you structure them in now, it's going to be to your benefit. So I can use it kind of almost as a future proofing tool. And that's where things like the future perspective, which I was very honored to have helped kind of, you know, um, pull yes. together with you guys. That that was really good fun. And, and I think that kind of thing was really useful. So that that's where I kind of go with the smaller companies. And bear in mind, I'm going to say it now because it's the, the Chris phrase. It's going to come out sooner or later. It depends on the context, right? So, but but in general, a smaller company, that's how I'll, I'll approach stuff. I kind of, I, I found the most traction actually with kind of, local medium to medium large um or, or kind of small international companies um and, and there's one I'm, I'm working with at the moment where they love the canvases they love what it can do there are different elements for different or, uh, parts of the company they're small enough that the culture has not stratified and become really kind of ridiculously rigid and, and that's not to say that a small company or a medium company can't have rigid traditional culture. There's a lot of that baked in, but but there's the intent and the goodwill and the fact that enough people know each other to still have those informal connections, you know, um, spread through or dispersed throughout that company. And that really matters, right? The, the informal kind of communications aspect. So you get a lot of traction with that because people doing the boards know each other. They, you know, there's a lot more interaction on the boards there. I found a huge amount of traction there across the board from leadership through to what I'm calling pre-mobilization or pre, sorry, pre-launch mobilizations holistically for large teams before we break them down to cross-functional teams or whatever we're doing, where you can then use smaller launches, which are, are kind of much tighter. Um, then you've got the kind of, you know, the story me, the story us, and I've been hearing rumors of the team, um, us and, and so forth, where, you know, you, you actually get to kind of re-establish those kind of bonding elements, which actually help people connect and do the most important decisions informally. You've got the entanglement aspects from complex adaptive systems theory. So there's all that good stuff built in there. You've also then got the uh, events planning with the like the heart of agile flavor and Mr. Coburn's work there, which is awesome stuff. So, you know, I, I really like the, the, the disparate parts. And I think that a, a medium-ish company values those different pieces and sees how they interlock then we get to the larger corporations which very often um and i'm going to be brutally honest here there's, there's nothing wrong necessarily with engaging large consultancies depending on the on the context um but they also get engaged for things that perhaps they shouldn't be when a company is less interested in a solution and they're more interested in the promise of possible future certainty that's how i'm going to put this right very so good. raised very yeah, yeah. so when when you get to that kind of area you're looking at a lot of pushback because they love it they love that kind of stuff they love all the canvases but then they say well we don't want to confuse people by introducing new frameworks we don't want to we already have this set thing that we've started doing and we produced this beautiful report from mckinsey or whoever where we're going to be following this now and and again you know in the grand scheme of things Perhaps there's nothing wrong with that per se, but when you're trying to say, well, this is a positioning tool to allow you to better understand that, they a larger corporation tends to see it as yet another framework that you're trying to implement. 
And let's face it, a lot of that does come out of the large and small consultancy work for coaches where people buy into something. And, and there's no blame here, by the way. People buy into something, they invest, and then that's what they push because that's what makes them money. So I, I, I find that it's harder to get it into large companies. However, if you do get the canvases and bits and pieces in there, it spreads quite rapidly until it hits the larger barriers of silos which tend to exist in those companies so the dissemination is much harder within large corporations i found personally your mileage may vary for anyone else who's kind of been doing this um, but yeah that that's how i've kind of uh, found it, it working within companies thus yeah, that's, far yeah that's really good to hear your experience with that you know um and, and part of the reason I got you on is because you've been working the very different shapes and size of it as well. Not to say that I don't like this. Um, also, you know, <laughs> so you're one of our UK guides. I, the, the question we get a lot um, in, in remote AF is, what is this guide? What is a guide? And, you know, I can talk about it, but I often think it's better to hear from somebody who is one of the guides. What's your your thoughts about what a what a, a remote agility framework guide really is oh so i think one of the things that attracted me to all of this was when i spoke to you all originally and i i think i was quite clear about my views on certification and stuff as a, as a specialist in learning and human learning and engagement you know that that's something that, that I'm, I'm quite keen on um and, and certifications and qualifications are very much the beginning of learning not the end of it um, and the fact that it was more experiential, it was more, look, we want to get you to a point where we can say you're a guide because you've learned this, you've done this, and you've contributed, not just you've achieved a bit on a bit of paper. And we all remember the paper MCSE cram sessions from the early 2000s and, you know, that kind of thing. It, it's, a, it, it's a tricky, it's a slippery slope. So that really attracted me uh, because that, kind of personified a lot of what a guide was about you know if you want another way of looking at it a guide is a leader and not a leader in terms of what companies now title people a leader in terms of somebody with positive influence who can inspire and motivate other people and perhaps nudge them via um, their own experience onto paths that may look good and this is where we kind of delve into the complexity theory side where we say well okay when you're looking at uncertain areas you actually have to douse for new paths you you are experimenting you're probing then you're sensing what's there and then you're acting right so you're finding new possible future um goals that may be even better than the one that you may or may not be able to get to right so that's what a guide does because another name for a guide is a pathfinder or a navigator or a right and this i mean it's a bit of a trick question in a way because i've just started my company finding shores with you know a partner and one of the biggest things behind that was a concept called tautai which is that i probably pronounced it badly but it's a samoan word which, which is essentially navigator sailor and what i love about this and this comes back to the, the the kind of holistic aspect is you're not just given a map and this is my biggest bugbear at the moment a guide doesn't look at a map and say here's where we are and we're aiming for this part on the map and we are following this route right that rarely works out and translates like it's a signifier a map it's it's a, a basic signifier of, of of you know your, your kind of topographical areas that doesn't signify the geology underneath that's created that for a start but it but it's also telling you where things are and it can be very useful um you can get a lot of meaning out of it but it can also lead you astray if you try to follow things and they don't translate properly from 2d to 3d anyone who's looked at a map and then walked that way will be able to see that I did this in Istanbul, by the way. I took a short route to the sea to a restaurant and found it went up seven hills up and down. And I was I was very ready for breakfast by the time I got there. It did not look like that on Google Maps. So I'm just saying, right? So there, there, there's context that you don't get with, with those kind of signifiers. Now, the, the concept of, of Taotai and the, the idea, especially I love marine environments, as, as you know personally, I, I like my diving and, and being on the water they they shift consistently that's very apt when you look at the business landscape which changes and it, it's accelerating you can't pick a point on a map you have to pick a direction using a compass perhaps and you have to then exactively adaptively find your way and that is exactly what a guide is being about it is finding a way 
and helping others find a way. The the beautiful thing about the Tao Tai kind of aspect is, you know, that that what I loved about going to these new shores was it's not done through tools. They're used to plan it, but it's a very loose plan. And then um, information was passed by song and by story. And story is a really important part. But then the navigation is taken holistically, where you look at the you know, color of the clouds to see where land is. You look at the marine life, you look at the currents, you look at the waves. And it's, it's this beautiful, holistic guiding of a whole culture from one shore to another. For me, that's what a guide is. And when you talked about it collectively as Remote AF talked about guide, and then you spoke about the reasons for picking it, that meshed extremely well with how I've always seen a guide, a navigator, somebody who inspires, motivates, and helps lead towards something of value. And it's a sustainable leading. And that's the last part that's important. You don't do the journey for them. A guide helps somebody along their own journey. So anyway, there's sorry, I've probably gone into a bit more too much detail there, but that that for me is the essence of, of a guide. That's it's really good to hear from your context, Chris. You know, that's that and that's why I asked that question. Interestingly enough, it's a, it, as you do, you've created a great segue for me into to something else I wanted to ask. Because, intentional, but I'll take it. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, I didn't script it with you, did I? So uh, but yeah, I think the thing that we really the other thing that we really get a lot of questioning around is okay, so what's a guide? And then the second part of that is what's this guide's course and why is that different from the other certification course? And I guess again. I can tell people, but it's great to hear from from someone who's been through it. So, so could you speak a little bit about your experience with the guides course and how that was different? Sure, and and I think it this is going to be um, not the same context as a lot of other people because I was on the early adopter program. So, yeah. in part, I I kind of I guess helped you refine it or help shape it or however you want to put it a little more than than a typical student would but but that in mind um i think i've been on other guides courses since then as, as a kind of a, a professional lurker which is one of my i guess i don't think it's a professional certification but it's one of the things i can do and i saw a very similar thing with the students on that course which is the ability to contribute and it's a contextual contribution so where a lot of courses that I have been on, that I've seen, that I've run in, in my time have been, here is content and we are going to deliver it to you. And our job is done when we have delivered that content. That, that's how most certification works. Now, not all of it, a lot of the delivery of a course is in how you deliver, not necessarily what the content is. There are some fantastic, for example, agile training houses out there, complexity training houses, much fewer of those, but, um, but with the guides course, I really liked the fact that we were a, a part of it. And as we went through, we, and this is the key aspect, we picked elements that um, Andrew, for example, has been working on for a number of, of years, and then we all explored them. That That is another word that ties in with being a guide, right? When you're a guide, you tend to explore things to find the best way. And during the course, we explored things and it made us feel like we were learning to be guides for a new landscape, a new remote landscape, if you want to put it that way. Um, and so that that was something that I, I found really appealing about it. Um, I do, you know, and, and I'll always kind of give the realistic view. I, I think if I could float one minor criticism, it's that there is so much in there. It, it almost just needs a lot more in terms of a course to explore. Um, because there's there's so much rich content it actually takes a long time to dive down into it so you know but that that's a totally different conversation and it's not a criticism by any stretch of the imagination really it's it's just an observation i guess but but yeah that that's my experience of, of the guides courses yeah it's well if we have to hear chris over richness is better than nothing right so <laughs> it's better to have too much and then to whittle it down than too little D depending on what you're doing, sometimes it's better to keep it simple and then just add what you need, but not no, miss the no, experiential sort of nature of the, the guys' course and making sure that it's it's built on both the experiential um, versions of things that we put together, our knowledge of it, and then and bringing in other people's stuff as well. So that that, that really that, that really comes through. By the way, when you when you all talk about 
things um, during the, the guides course, all the different modules, the aspects. There, there are masses of, of examples, use cases, but also you can you can hear the two things that, that really work during a course are when somebody talks about something with passion and they talk about something with experience. And actually, I'm going to add a third. They talk about something with keenness to learn and the acknowledgement that they don't know everything, that yeah. they're however much they know, whatever experience you have, you will find something different and you are going to have to react to it for the first time. And those, I, I guess those three things are really important. And I did pick up on that during the guides course. So that was good. That was really good. Chris, that's been a fantastic um, interview. We're at the end of our time. So I can only thank you for spending this time with me. Um, oh, for, uh, for the for the viewers, let's do a bit of a shameless plug here. Uh, you did you did slip it in before, but where can you know if somebody in the UK wants to leverage you as a UK guide or yourself and your company, where can they find you? Oh, yeah, so it, it wasn't a deliberate plug, but I'll, I'll run with it. So findingshore.com. Um, you you can find me on Finding Shores somewhere. Um, and, and, you know, we look at things like agility and complexity and distributed um, working and learning and, and engagement. So it's, and I, for me, that's a very holistic thing. So finding shores very much is this, this whole guides thing. It, it really meshed nicely. It wasn't deliberate. It was just serendipitous, right? So let's do, do the, the, the Dave thing of managing serendipity, I think. Um, so you can you can find that there. You can find obviously I'm on LinkedIn as Christopher Bramley, which only my mother, my publisher, and apparently you tend to call me. Um, usually when I've done something wrong in my mother's case. Um, I do also have I, I might as well mention it. I do have a TEDx talk and collaboration. Uh, I've got a number of other talks as well. So I have a YouTube channel called The Gentle Iconoclast, which is massively out of date. So just ignore stuff on there. But I also do talk about things like um, imposter syndrome, neurodiversity, mental health and stuff as well. So, you know, you can you can do that. And at some point, there's another book coming out to do with learning and complexity and whatever. But I'm not even going to bother mentioning more about that because I haven't, I haven't even started that. So, uh, yeah, that's that's brilliant. I'm Tony from Remote AF and thanks for listening to all the remote things. And remember, for all things remote, you can find us at remoteaf.co.